Is capitalism inherently racist? Hey, I got an idea. How about no? Yeah, racism is integrally linked to capitalism. Uh, and, and I think it's a mistake to assume that we can combat racism by leaving capitalism in place. So this might be the worst video on the internet. And as you can imagine, that's up against some pretty stiff competition. <laughs> But I think I can justify the claim. After all, this latest hemorrhoid from AJ Plus attempts to malign both capitalism, an economic system which has literally dragged billions out of abject poverty, and the United States, the nation most associated with that system, not to mention all of the other towering contributions America has made to broader civilization. Why? 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 Why would they do this? Activists and leaders have taken racial justice one step further, demanding an end to capitalism. And many black liberation thinkers have been critical of capitalism, like W.E.B. Du Bois, Malcolm X, and Hugh P. Newton. <laughs> okay, let me explain what's going on right now. And I hope you're all sitting down for this, because here's the news. Black people in America are failing. <gasps> it's true. Uh, hashtag not all, hashtag Morgan Freeman. This failure is their fault. I repeat, this failure is their fault. Nobody forces black fathers to abandon their families. Nobody encourages black children to drop out of college. Nobody mandates the formation of black gangs, nor sanctions the criminal lifestyle they pursue. It's their fault. It's not your fault. It's not my fault. <laughs> That's what I said, it's their fault. However, the soft bigotry of no expectations is so pervasive that we would sooner erase everything of value, every institution, every belief, every memory, than ask black people to take responsibility for themselves. The irony here, of course, is this cowardice on our part will doom not only us, but them. For there is no escaping the reality that if you value universal goods like life, liberty, prosperity, and general well-being, undermining America and American principles is intellectual suicide bombing. It's the philosophical equivalent of shooting your doctor in the face when only he can remove your tumour. You got to freeze capitalism, Nixon! Freeze capitalism! That's a problem! Oh, please, Stokely Carmichael? A man so radical, the Black Panthers kicked him out. <laughs> but yeah, he did say that uh, capitalism was the problem. But then again, he also said that the greatest white man who ever lived was Adolf Hitler. So, I'm not sure the extent to which we should be taking uh, political advice from uh, Mr. Carmichael. I mean, <laughs> come on. I mean, Adolf Hitler? We all know it was Joseph Goebbels, don't we, lads? <laughs> it was a joke. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> So, what does racism have to do with our economic system? Uh, by the way, this video is like a lasagna of bullshit. There are several layers to dig through, so bear with me. Uh, first of all, capitalism is our economic system now? What is this? 1850? <laughs> America hasn't been capitalist for a hundred years! Now, she retains elements of capitalism, of course, and it's those elements that keep her competitive. But in the 21st century, the US is clearly a mixed economy, right? I mean, you rank but 17th on the index of economic freedom. And it's no coincidence while we're here that countries higher up, like Switzerland, Singapore, 
Ireland and Hong Kong also lead every other league table worth being at the top of. But to slander capitalism as racist when its limited application has brought wealth to peoples of every colour around the world is completely mental. First, we have to define what capitalism even is. It's an economic system in which private individuals and corporations control the means of production, aka the resources and tools used to generate wealth. God forbid. Sorry, what? <laughs> individuals owning the tools to generate wealth, as opposed to kings, bishops, or commissars owning everything and throwing scraps to their slimiest sycophants? Have we gone back in time? I feel like we're going backwards in time. And as the system evolved with time, those who had been enslaved or serfs now worked for wages. But those wages never equaled the value of the goods they produced, which is how the owners who made the profits kept growing their wealth. Wait, time out, time out. I've got to get my head around that sentence. Say it again. But those wages never equaled the value of the goods they produced, which is how the owners who made the profits kept growing their wealth. Wow. Look, I get that people don't understand economics, okay? Because education is a corpse and economics is hard. But if you're gonna talk about it and can't even grasp the trader principle, you really should shut up, right? You really should. Why on earth would an employer pay you precisely what you produce? I mean, just think about it. If you add $20 worth of value to a company every hour, they're not going to pay you $20 an hour, are they? They might as well keep the money. Obviously, owners need to make a profit to justify investing their capital in your labour. If they couldn't do that, the shareholders would have no incentive to stick around and you don't have a job. But that's only half the story, of course, because although your wage of $15 an hour, let's say, is worth $20 to your employer, it's also worth more to you than your time. Because if it weren't, if your time were worth more, you'd either start your own business and prove it, or find another employer to pay you more. So, in other words, the salary you receive reflects market price and adds value to both parties. It's a win-win. <laughs> Please tell me that people understand this, right? And I'm not just shouting into the ether here. But we're not done. What was that bit about growing wealth there at the end? But those wages never equaled the value of the goods they produced, which is how the owners who made the profits kept growing their wealth. Everybody grows their wealth, okay? Workers grow their salaries as they become more productive, and owners grow their profits as they reap the rewards of investment. Unless they don't, of course. Unless the company goes under, which happens all the time. People have no concept of how difficult it is to run a successful enterprise, and the wealth shareholders generate reflects the level of their input as well as the personal risk they shoulder. Cue Ben Shapiro, demolishing pencil factory guy. The owner of the factory carries the risk, therefore he gets the benefit. The workers in the company you mentioned, if that company were to go bankrupt, they would carry the risk as well as the benefit. If the company goes bankrupt and this guy has to pay off all of his debts, the worker may lose his job, but he's not the one who's going to incur the debt of having gone bankrupt. If you incur risk, then you're the one who pays the downside. The worker does not pay the downside. Okay, it is the investor who pays the downside, who invested in all the machinery, who sunk millions of dollars into making your labor productive. Because guess what? Your labor is without that machinery. Gunk. Nothing. You don't have a pencil to put together. You don't got the wood. You don't got the, you don't got the paint. You don't got the rubber. You don't got the metal. You got nothing. Right? You're sitting there, standing outside, twiddling your thumbs. 
It required somebody to invest, who do you think put more in? The guy who spent millions of dollars buying all the machinery, leasing the place, making sure there was a management structure, doing the LLC formation, making sure all the tax code was in compliance, or you standing outside because you can stick a piece of graphite into a piece of wood. <laughs> But COVID-19 is bringing the U.S. economy to its knees. At least 14 million people lost their jobs between February and May of 2020 due to coronavirus. So what we're seeing is that the pandemic has really brought to the surface that people are doing much, much worse than is being projected. Christ, the sheer state of that sign. I could do a whole video on that sign, right? Now is not the time. But needless to say, the person holding that should be fucking keel hauled, right? There is no excuse in 2021. Institutional manipulation will only award you a certain amount of sympathy from me. I get the media lies, okay? I get that politicians feed those lies. I get that there are entire institutions like Al Jazeera, that propagate BLM claptrap purely to undermine Western society. But there comes a point when you have to take responsibility for your own idiocy. Christopher Hitchens used to say, people aren't being fooled, they are fools. And I respect that sign-waving wanker enough to pull him out of the crowd and say, right, you justify that shit right now in front of me. Because I'll tell you something, uh, to anyone with a rudimentary knowledge of the realities around black crime, police shootings, and the Michael Brown case you're referencing, you look ridiculous. And this is obviously following along racial, class, and regional lines. Those who are racialized as black are suffering at a, a, a disproportionate rate or a different rate because of economic and structural factors. Ugh. Imagine if these people cared enough about blacks to actually address why COVID affects them at disproportionate rates of underlying health conditions like obesity, for example, which is pushing 40% in that community, of biological factors including vitamin D deficiency and susceptibility to disease more generally. I can't imagine the endless BLM protests throughout the summer of 2020 helped much. And what about attitudes to vaccination? Do you think they might have some impact on mortality going forward? I mean, just look at this graph, right? Now, people aren't going to want to hear it. But this is the bell curve in action. Okay, I didn't invent this survey, right? It was done by Pew. Intention to be vaccinated by ethnicity. Who's at the top? Lo and behold, it's the Asians coming in strong there at 83%. Uh, Mr. Kim, do you intend to get the COVID vaccine? Uh, well, uh, let me think. It'll take five minutes. It's free of charge, and it might stop me from dying. So, yes, <laughs> right? I mean, it's just so obvious. Then you have the whites and Hispanics in second place. Uh, no surprises there. I mean, there are a lot of dumb white people around. Let's be honest. Uh, but bringing up the rear at 42%, it's the blacks. <laughs> I mean, look, you couldn't make it up, right? This is the world we live in, all right? Are people beginning to grasp it now? Because I feel like the drunk dickhead who ruins the magic show by screeching at the stage, he's palming it. He's palming the fucking card. But can't you all see that? Even in a moment of sort of national crisis, the police violence, the state violence has not abated. And I think that that has really um, incited some, some radicalism in people. Black people are disproportionately dying at the hands of police and because of health disparities. The demand for the end to capitalism is an understanding that this system of economic exploitation and subjection is really at the root of these forms of racialized 
uh, state violence and state sanctioned uh, savagery and killing. What an absurd human being. And notice how this video has devolved into Everything we don't like is capitalism, right? So COVID, uh, the cops, obviously, uh, America, generally, uh, the finale of Game of Thrones, let's throw that in there. I mean, how convenient for you. Uh, look, the entire BLM narrative around police violence is fiction on a level that Lewis Carroll would have enjoyed, but say it wasn't, right? Say it's all true. Are they seriously claiming that socialist societies have done away with state-sanctioned savagery and killing? That's capitalism, is it? I mean, how can you talk so much and know so little? So, how did we get here? Well, through a forcible process called Marx called primitive accumulation. Now, speak of the devil. I mean, just <laughs> unironically quoting the greatest mass murderer in the history of philosophy there. Oh, sorry, love. What did Marx have to say again? Oh, yeah, now I remember. I don't give a shit. Basically, slavery was the American economy's startup money. In the 60 years leading up to the Civil War, the amount of daily cotton picked by enslaved black people increased by 400%. This stolen wealth made millionaires out of white plantation owners and helped propel the US as a leader in the global economy. And even MLK said, the fact is that capitalism was built on the exploitation and suffering of black slaves and continues to thrive on the exploitation of the poor. What absolute or a Brief History of American Prosperity By the 1830s, the late British economist Angus Madison showed American per capita income was already the highest in the world. One might suppose that the nation could thank its geographical size and abundance of natural resources for its remarkable wealth. Yet other countries in the 19th century, Brazil is a good example, had profuse resources and vast territories but failed to turn them to comparable economic advantage. And I'll just interject here. They also had just as many slaves. Okay, in fact, by 1850, five million Africans had been brought to Brazil, whereas the North American slave population barely topped four million. So if your theory is that slavery made America rich, Brazil should be richer, and it ain't. A major reason that Brazil failed to compete was their lack of strong intellectual property rights. The US Constitution, by contrast, was the first in history to protect intellectual property rights. It empowered Congress to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. As Thomas Jefferson, who became the first commissioner of the patent office, observed, the absence of accumulated wealth in the new nation meant that its most important economic resource was innovation. And America's laws encouraged that innovation from the outset. He's describing capitalism. Okay, innovation, property rights, and entrepreneurial gusto. Another reason for early American prosperity was that the scarcity of population in a vast territory had pushed labor costs up from the very beginning of the colonial era. By the early 19th century, American wages were significantly higher than those in Europe. This meant that landowners, to make a profit, needed high levels of productivity, and that in turn meant the mechanization of agriculture, which got underway in America before it did overseas. The replacement of labor with capital investment helped usher in the American Industrial Revolution as the first industrial entrepreneurs took advantage of engineering advances developed in the fields. The southern states made a great economic as well as moral error in deciding to keep exploiting slaves instead of hiring well-paid workers and embracing new engineering technologies. The South started to catch up with the rest of the nation economically only after turning fully to advanced engineering in the 1960s as a response to rising labor costs. So 
slavery made America poorer than she would have been had she not had slaves. I want people to understand this. This is not up for debate. And then I'm not going to debate you, Jerry. Okay. I'm not going to sit here and debate. And yet, this pseudo economics, pseudo history, it will not die. Vast hordes of people are so fundamentally ignorant, it's a wonder they still know how to breathe. World War II, which devastated Europe's economies but left the U.S. mainland untouched, turned the U.S. into the world's major capitalist power. This acceleration of capitalism started to generate resistance among working people, including intellectuals. They advocated and pushed for an alternative to capitalism, which, keep in mind, used profit as a way to organize the economy. This alternative was socialism. In case you're wondering what socialism actually means, it advocates for public rather than private ownership of the means of creating wealth. And look at that, another placard pushing donkey. Join the Freedom Socialist Party. Yeah, I will, mate. I will. Uh, right after my application to the Jewish Nazi Party is approved. What the fuck are you talking about? Freedom necessitates capitalism, okay? You cannot be free unless your economic system values individual rights of property and contract. As Milton Friedman pointed out years ago, you can have capitalism without freedom, potentially, as they do in China to some extent, but there has never been a free society on earth without capitalism does not exist. I uh, have been talking for an hour. I would like to talk to you for 10 hours. In a full discussion, I would certainly agree with you that capitalism is not a sufficient condition for freedom. It's a necessary condition for freedom. I never said that wherever you had capitalism, you had freedom. I never said that. I never made that statement. I made the opposite statement. Wherever you had freedom, you had capitalism. Capitalism is a necessary condition for freedom, but not a sufficient condition for freedom. In addition, you need relatively broad access to capital and a relatively free market. Again, relatively. You need com competition. I usually refer to it as competitive capitalism to distinguish it from certain kinds of systems which have been capitalist and have all of the bad qualities that you described. Although societies ruled by communist parties like the Soviet Union supposedly practiced socialist economies, their systems were also brutally authoritarian, which is why the communist model is rejected by those who proclaim themselves democratic socialists. So this is what the radical left would have you believe, okay? Soviet Russia, Mao's China, the Khmer Rouge, North Vietnam, North Korea, Venezuela today. That's not socialism, right? That's communism. Even though the definition of socialism they just gave is identical to the Marxist definition of communism, but let's gloss over that. And at the same time, Hitler, Mussolini, Franco, Pinochet, that's real fascism, yeah? And so similar to modern right-wing politics that we might as well lump everybody together and call Trump a Nazi. Sure, Dan. And notice how democracy is their god, right? We're democratic socialists, as if that makes it better in some way, <laughs> makes it worse, if anything. Uh, and uh, I've got to call out the right wing here on this. I know many of you listening will consider yourselves uh, on the right, but there is an unhealthy devotion to democracy across the political aisle these days, and I'm not on that train, okay? I agree with Churchill. Uh, democracy is the best of a bad lot, and we seem to value it in the West because we feel like everybody should get a say over the lives of everybody else, but this is precisely why I'm such a champion of Hong Kong prior to uh, 97, of course. Hong Kong never had democracy. It had liberty, right? It had property rights and a court system to arbitrate disputes. They didn't have a vote. What are they going to vote on? <laughs> Which arbitrary characteristic should be protected under the, the newest 
legion of hate speech laws. And this is what America understood to some extent in the 18th century. And as they've moved away from that model, they've become more democratic, yes, but less free. Socialism is having a moment in American politics right now. And that's freaking a lot of people out. And if you look at the stats, it's not a surprise. For example, the number of billionaires in the United States has more than doubled since 2008. And in the past 30 years, the wealth of US billionaires increased over 1,000%. That's more than 200 times greater than the increase of US median wealth over the same period. Uh, oh, of course, because it's all about inequality, isn't it? It doesn't matter that everybody is richer now than they were 30 years ago, uh, which even they acknowledge, right? Uh, what really matters is that some people got richer, faster than others. Uh, never mind the fact that the productivity of those billionaires is largely what's dragging everybody else up. I mean, they are so far from understanding that as an economic concept, it's laughable. But here we see what Thatcher pointed out in the 1980s, Left-wing policy is not based on compassion for the poor, but hatred for the rich. I think I must have hit the right nail on the head when I pointed out that the logic of those policies are they'd rather have the poor poorer. Once they start to talk about the gap, they'd rather the gap was that. <laughs> Down here. You do not create wealth and opportunity that way. You do not create a property-owning democracy that way. And who are the rich? Who are these billionaires we should be castigating so? Well, the three richest people in the US today are Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, and Bill Gates, right? Does anybody seriously feel like they don't deserve their wealth? Like, they've stolen something from the rest of us. Microsoft has revolutionized the workplace, raising productivity to almost incalculable levels. Amazon streamlined retail, making it cheaper, easier, more efficient, worldwide. And go and read what Elon Musk is up to over at Neuralink. I mean, the technology that man is developing will... It's God tier. It's fucking God tier. I'm talking knowledge, immortality, the whole works. It's frightening what the human race is on the verge of achieving. Do you think you could do what he does? Are you going to kneecap that guy? Are you best placed to determine how he should spend his money and run his business? Give me a break. Give me a Kit Kat. I could live a hundred lives and never muster the arrogance to dictate to geniuses in that way. But here I give you socialism, ladies and gentlemen. Unbelievable. So what happens next? Critiques of capitalism are happening on the ground. Efforts to build alternatives to capitalism are happening right now, whether it's through sharing economies, whether it's through mutual aid. These are efforts and visions at something else that's possible. People who have been historically subjected to racialization, colonialism, and imperialism deserve the right to determine their own destinies. Uh, you can leave any time, baby, because I gotta be honest, if the choice is between abandon capitalism and separation, I suggest Congress just purchase some island real estate for the blacks who want to go. But why not? I mean, obviously, within six months, it'll be less Wakanda and more Lord of the Flies, but they deserve the right to determine their own destiny. So maybe they'll let us film it. That'd be nice. A fresh commission for the Horror Channel? <clears throat> 
reality is going to sucker punch these people like no tomorrow. And do you want to know something? Something interesting? Their African cousins are growing out of this nonsense now. In fact, Africa has become the world's fastest growing continent in recent decades, thanks to capitalism. The Economist produced a report just last year titled The African Century, where they explain in detail how free market policies have been paramount in improving the lives of blacks across the region, in documenting why some African nations develop faster than others. The first lesson, apparently, is the importance of stable government. The second is that economic policies matter. When Kenya and Tanzania gained independence in the early 1960s, they had similar economies, dependent on farming and almost identical incomes per head. Both initially suppressed democracy to run authoritarian one-party states, but they chose very different economic models. Tanzania nationalized big companies and forced people onto collective farms in the name of African socialism. Kenya embraced free markets. Today, Kenyans are 14% wealthier, adjusted for purchasing power, or 80% wealthier by market exchange rates. And it just goes on, right? Uh, Mauritius is all the more striking when set against its bigger neighbor, Madagascar, which seemed far more likely to succeed because of its richer natural resources and bigger population. In the 1970s, just as Mauritius began attracting foreign investors, Madagascar thought it was a fine idea to send them packing. It expelled the American ambassador and nationalized two American oil companies. While Mauritius was helping find export markets for its sugar farmers, Madagascar began grabbing land from its commercial farmers. It is one of the few countries in the world to have become poorer over the past 50 years because of disastrous socialist policies and repeated political crises. Again, case closed. Okay, it's done. Citing capitalism as racist, citing capitalism as an obstacle to wealth, an obstacle to black success around the world is right up there with uh, the horse and cart are here to stay and the internet will never amount to anything. It's one of the stupidest things ever said on any subject ever. And if these people were listened to, more blacks would be in relative poverty, not to mention more whites and everyone in between. Fuck socialism. Fuck BLM, fuck Al Jazeera, long live America, and long live capitalism. Good night. Uh, I missed a doctor for I had a question for you. You said that you're one of your problems in creating an equal playing field, creating equal opportunities that you have to take from someone though to bring the same thing back. Uh, to create inequality as we currently have it, you had to take from someone to bring that, to create that inequality. People lost something for that inequality to be sustained. Uh, American ruggedness was not just what created America. America taking from other people to create that. So how do you reconcile that? How do you? So I don't accept your premise. That is, uh, well, I'm not going to say there weren't any injustices in American history. Obviously, there were. Uh, the world is not a sewer of some game. That is, the wealth is not about taking from other people. We today in the world are far, far, far richer by, I mean, it's, it's hard for you to, and all of us to imagine how much richer we are than we were 250 years ago. As, as, as a, the whole world, right? We didn't take it from anybody, there are no aliens from which we stole. Wealth is created. And we are richer, the people who are richer today didn't take it from other people. They created new wealth that didn't exist before. Now, are there injustices in the past? Yes. Uh, slavery, uh, certainly what was done to American Indians, but that doesn't explain the wealth that we have today. If anything, that retarded wealth. Uh, it, it didn't increase wealth, it retarded wealth. There's a reason why the North was richer than the South and won the Civil War, because it, it didn't have slavery. It, not having slavery encourages freedom, it encourages people to work harder, it encourages production, it became more industrial, and therefore it became richer. And that's why it won the war. Other than, it, of course, it was white, which uh, 
what would hope the right side win, wins all wars. It doesn't always happen that way. So I don't buy into the zero-sum game that, that you're hypothesizing. Wealth is not an issue of redistribution. Wealth is something to be created, at least under freedom. Now, pre-freedom, pre-capitalism, pre-industrial revolution, we had a zero-sum world. The wealth was very, I don't know if you've ever seen these, these wonderful income and wealth graphs that go back 10,000 years. And they measure uh, human wealth, the human income, 10,000 years as today. And it, it, the graph is basically flat. It goes up a little bit, down a little bit. And then in 17 something, it goes like that. It goes suddenly through the roof. And in Asia, that doesn't happen. In Asia, it stays flat. And somewhere around 1970 something, it goes like that. And what happens is when you institute freedom, when you institute capitalism, the ugly word that so many people fear, wealth suddenly explodes. Not because it's taken from somebody, but because it's created. I just read a story, the World Bank just today came out with a, with a statistic. For the first time in human history, uh, less than 10% of the planet, of the human beings on the planet, live below what is defined as extreme poverty. That is to be celebrated. That should be a headline in every newspaper, because it won't, because nobody wants to talk about it. But why is that? Because India and China and other places in Asia and some places even in Africa have adopted elements of capitalism and suddenly they're richer for it. So it's, it's, they haven't taken anything from something they've created out of nothing.